time together entitled Understanding Daniel and we're doing a verse by verse study through the book of Daniel. We'd like to welcome those who are joining us online across the country and around the world. We also want to welcome those who are here in person, our regular church members and also some who are visiting with us not only from California, but even from some other places. We want to welcome all of you. Thank you for being a part of our study. And as I mentioned, this is a in-depth verse-by-verse study of the book of Daniel. Today we're in Daniel chapter 4, and this is part 2 of our study on Daniel chapter 4. But before we get to our lesson, let's start with a word of prayer. Dear Father, once again we are grateful for this time where we can just gather together in your house to worship you, but also to study your word. And Lord, as we look at a very important passage found in Daniel, there's so many lessons, practical lessons for us today. We do ask for your Holy Spirit to come and guide our minds and our hearts and lead us into a clearer and a full understanding of Bible truth. The Bible is your book, so we need your Spirit to guide us. In Jesus' name, amen. Okay, a little bit of background to bring us up to where we are in our study of Daniel. I think we're around Daniel verse 18, chapter 4, verse 18 is where we finished up last week. A little background to the story. You'll remember that uh, Nabopolassar was the father of Nebuchadnezzar. Nebopolassar, father of Nebuchadnezzar, was part of the Assyrian Empire. He was actually a general during the time of the Assyrian Empire, and he was given the task of conquering or subduing a rebellion, an uprising that occurred in Babylon in Mesopotamia. So he went on behalf of the Assyrian king. He subdued the uprising in Babylon, And as a reward for him being successful, he was given Babylon. He was made king of Babylon. And that occurred in 625 B.C., 625 before Christ. But then around 612 B.C., as Babylon continued to grow in power, Egypt and the Medes also were growing in power, they rebelled against Assyria. And Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, joined in this rebellion against Assyria And so in 612, there was a revolt. They cast off the Assyrian yoke. But as Babylon's ambition for world dominance continued to grow, eventually Nabopolassar came into conflict with Pharaoh Necho, the king of Egypt. And there was a big showdown that that occurred. So you have Necho, king of Egypt, bringing a large army up north because you had to surround um, the Arabian desert if you're going to go to war with Babylon. And he sent up a large army, and at the same time, Nebuchadnezzar gathered an army from Babylon, and he put his son Nebuchadnezzar in charge of the army. And Nebuchadnezzar led the army, and they met in a place called Carchemish, where a battle took place between the Egyptians and the Babylonians. The Babylonians won. And then Nebuchadnezzar continued south towards Egypt, conquering as he went, and that's when he surrounded Jerusalem in 605 B.C., And the story that we have recorded in Daniel chapter 1, verse 1, where Babylon fell to Nebuchadnezzar, Daniel and his friends were taken captive, and some of the treasury from the temple was taken back to Babylon. That's when that occurred. Now, while Nebuchadnezzar had just conquered Jerusalem, he received word that his father, Nebuchadnezzar, had died in Babylon. So leaving the captives, among whom the Jews are mentioned, under the control of Nebuchadnezzar, um, Nebuchadnezzar, or under his general, Nebuchadnezzar marched quickly to get back to Babylon. He went the short desert route to secure the throne in Babylon, and his general brought the captives all the way back eventually to Babylon. So Nebuchadnezzar becomes a very powerful king after the death of his father, and the empire continues to grow. And God begins to reveal himself using Daniel, using dreams, using circumstances. The God of heaven begins to reveal himself to Nebuchadnezzar in a most remarkable way. Now, of course, here we have the map of Babylon. This is the territory that was occupied by ancient Babylon. If you look at the map, you'll notice there where Babylon is, the ancient city over here on this side. You'll also notice where Jerusalem, which is over there. You had, it's not up yet. Let's see, it'll come up here in just a minute. You have uh, Nebuchadnezzar bringing an army coming up. Oh, wait, you can't see. Can we put the slides on the screen for those of you who are watching? Um, You have Nebuchadnezzar of Babylon coming up against the army. There we go. Okay, let's see if this works. So you have Nebuchadnezzar leading up his army. Carchemish is where they had this big showdown in the north. You have Pharaoh Necho of Egypt coming up. They have the battle. Nebuchadnezzar brings his armies down. They surround Jerusalem. He receives word that his father died, so he comes back to Babylon, the desert route. Daniel and his friends are taken back to Babylon, but they go the more traditional route 
down past the river Euphrates. Now, the first dream that Nebuchadnezzar the king has is recorded for us in Daniel chapter 2. And you'll remember in Daniel chapter 2, Nebuchadnezzar has a dream, and in his dream he sees a giant. What does he see? He sees a statue or a giant image. Now, what's unique about the statue? It's made up of different kinds of metal, right? What's the head of the image made up of? Who does or what does the gold in Daniel chapter 2 represent? The head of gold represents the golden empire of Babylon. Chest and arms made of silver, which represents what kingdom? Medo-Persia. Remember, Medo-Persia was to conquer Babylon. It did. Uh, why are there two arms that make up the chest and arms of silver? Well, there was a combination of two powers. You have the Medes and the Persians that work together. The Medes came up first, but the Persians grew stronger and eventually dominated and ruled. That's an interesting little side note. The belly and the thighs of brass in Daniel chapter 2 represents what kingdom? The kingdom of Greece. And who was the first notable king that conquered much land and territory? Alexander the Great. And we talk about him later on when we get to Daniel chapter 7. And then after the uh, belly and thighs of brass, you have the legs made of iron, representing the iron monarchy of Rome. Now, just like you have two arms, you have two legs. Uh, the kingdom of Rome was really comprised of two parts. You had pagan Rome and you had papal Rome. It's interesting to note that pagan Rome came up first, but papal Rome that grew up later ruled a lot longer than pagan Rome and occupied or controlled more territory than pagan Rome. And then you have the feet of iron and clay. And what do the feet of, feet of iron and clay represent in Daniel chapter 2? It's Western Europe, right? Some of the nations are strong, some of the nations are weak. You have a combination of church and state. You have the clay that was used to mold the iron. You had religion influencing the state or the civil authorities or governments. But then in Daniel chapter 2, a stone is cut out without hands that comes and strikes the image upon its feet and grinds all of the various metals to powder and the wind comes and blows them all away. The stone grows and becomes a great mountain and fills the whole earth. Who does that stone represent? represents the establishment of Christ's kingdom, the second coming of Christ, and eventually at the end of the thousand years, when the earth is made new, it represents Christ's kingdom. So right at the beginning, God reveals to Nebuchadnezzar the king that his kingdom, Babylon, was not to last forever, but it's the God of heaven who was to establish a kingdom that would last forever, it never come to an end. Now at first, Nebuchadnezzar, after Daniel explained the dream and its meaning, he was very impressed, and he acknowledged the Most High God. But as time went on, Nebuchadnezzar kind of allowed pride and, and uh, a desire for his kingdom to last forever. He allowed that to dominate in his heart and mind. Then there's another experience that we read about in Daniel chapter 3. And you remember Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego? How that Nebuchadnezzar built this giant image made of total gold or all of gold, representing the Babylonian kingdom that would never come to an end. I mean, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego refused to bow down to the golden image and then were thrown into the fiery furnace and God delivered them in a most miraculous way, then Nebuchadnezzar again acknowledges the God of heaven, the Most High God. Talks about one like unto the Son of Man that was with Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego in the fire, the form of the fourth man like the Son of God. He acknowledges the great God of heaven, and he humbles his heart. But again, as time goes on, Nebuchadnezzar begins to become proud. He looks at all the things that he has built, and once again he starts thinking about his kingdom. He doesn't want his kingdom to end. And God, in his mercy, gives Nebuchadnezzar another dream. This is the second dream. Very interesting dream. In this dream, he sees a giant tree. And the tree has beautiful leaves and branches and the birds of heaven. They nest in the branches of the tree. All of the beasts of the field gather in the shade provided by the tree. There's a lot of fruit that sustains. It's the biggest tree. It fills the whole earth. It sustains uh, so many on earth. But then there is a message that comes, a heavenly watcher comes down from heaven and says, chop down the tree, leave just the stump with a band of iron and a band of brass. Well, at first, Nebuchadnezzar, he senses that this is a significant dream, and he calls for his wise men, and he tells them the dream, and he says, tell me the meaning of the dream, and they can tell the king the dream. Finally, Daniel is brought before the king, and the king tells Daniel the dream, and then Daniel gives the interpretation. Now, that's where we stopped. We brought up to this dream last time. So we write about now, after Nebuchadnezzar has told the dream, Daniel is about to interpret the dream. And this is where we pick up the story. Daniel chapter 4, verse 18. If you have your notes, Daniel chapter 4, verse 18, or if you're following along, the notes will be on the screen. 
It says, this dream I, King Nebuchadnezzar, have seen. This is Nebuchadnezzar speaking. Now you, Belteshazzar, that's the Babylonian name of Daniel, declare its interpretation. Since all the wise men of my kingdom are not able to make known to me the interpretation, but you are able, for the spirit of the holy God is in you. So Nebuchadnezzar, even though he's a pagan king, he does acknowledge that there is something powerful about Daniel's God. The spirit of the holy God is in him. Nebuchadnezzar does not even ask Daniel if he can explain the dream. He simply states that because the spirit of the holy God is in him, he can declare the interpretation of the dream. Once more, Nebuchadnezzar is forced to acknowledge the supremacy of the Hebrew God over his own Babylonian gods. Verse 19. Then Daniel, whose name was Belteshazzar, was astonished for a time, and his thoughts troubled him. So the king spoke and said, Belteshazzar, do not let the dream or its interpretation trouble you. Belteshazzar answered and said, My lord, may the dream concern those who hate you, and its interpretation concern your enemies. So right from Daniel's response, was the dream good news or was it bad news for the king? Clearly it was bad news. Belteshazzar, which is Daniel, he says, the dream is really for your enemies. It's not a good dream. To Daniel, the dream's meaning is plain, and its significance was clear. He realized that God had laid upon him the solemn responsibility of warning Nebuchadnezzar of threatened judgments if he did not humble himself and repent of his pride. The hesitation of Daniel, who was astonished for a time, was not because of any difficulty he had interpreting the dream, but rather for the delicate matter of how to make known this dream's meaning to the king. Doubtless, he prayed for wisdom on how best to tell the king, and although he initially hesitated, he knew that his duty before God was to speak the truth, whatever the consequences. So God brought a warning message to the king. Daniel was the chosen vessel through whom this warning message was to be given. Now, is there judgment coming upon the world before Jesus comes? The first angel's message says with a loud voice, fear God, give glory to him for the what? For the hour of his judgment has come. Now those three angels' messages, the first angel that talks about true worship, the third angel that talks about false worship, if anyone worship the beast or his image, the second angel that announces that Babylon is fallen, is fallen, those three angels' messages or that warning message, it is to be given to every nation, kindred, tongue, and people. Who are those angels representing in Revelation chapter uh, 14? Who do they represent? The three angels, who do they represent? God's people in the last days, right? So just like Daniel had a role to play in providing a warning message to Nebuchadnezzar, so God's people in the last days, you and I, his church, we have a message of warning that needs to go to every nation, kindred, tongue, and people before the close of probation, before Jesus comes. Okay, verse 20. The tree that you saw, Daniel now speaking, which grew and became strong, whose height reached to the heavens and which could be seen by all the earth. So again, in the dream, you saw this giant tree. Daniel now stood before Nebuchadnezzar. A solemn duty rested upon him to tell the king the truth as given by God and not to flatter the earthly for earthly gain. He began by recounting the king's dream and sharing the interpretation of each part. Jeremiah chapter 23, talking about the work of a prophet, it says, the prophet who has a dream, let him tell the dream. And he who has my word, this is the Lord speaking, let him speak my word faithfully. What is the chaff to the wheat, saith the Lord? Is not my word like a fire, says the Lord, and like a hammer it breaks the rock in pieces? Notice that we have the prophet who is to stand before the people. The prophet is not to speak his own words, but he is to speak the word that the Lord has given him, and he is to speak the word boldly. The word of God is powerful, sharper than any two-edged sword. Here it's described as a hammer that can break the rock into pieces. Now, what do you think the rock might symbolize? Well, the Bible says that our hearts are like stone. He'll give us a heart of flesh. It's the word of God that breaks the stubborn heart, that can bring conversion, a change of heart. It also is a warning that the judgment day is coming, that the kingdom is to be established, also symbolized by a rock. Jesus says, whoever falls upon this rock or this stone shall be broken, 
but woe unto the one upon whom it falls, for it shall grind him to powder. Now, when Jesus says, whoever falls upon the stone, he shall be broken, the stone there is Jesus. We are to fall upon Jesus. We are to come to the foot of the cross. Our hearts are to be broken and cleansed. But if we refuse to fall upon the stone, judgment day is coming when the stone falls upon us, according to Daniel chapter 2. It talks about grinding the kingdoms to powder. So there is a work, a faithful work, that needs to be done by God's people. Verse 21, still speaking about the dream and the tree, whose leaves were lovely and its fruit abundant, in which was food for all, under which the beasts of the field dwelt, and in whose branches the birds of the heaven had their home. Nebuchadnezzar and the kingdom of Babylon are symbolized by this magnificent tree which provides for the well-being of both man and beast. It is interesting to note that the book of Revelation also describes a tree that sustains the citizens of the New Jerusalem. The difference is that the tree symbolizing Babylon is cut down, but the tree of life continues forever, a symbol of the eternal kingdom of God. So this great tree in Daniel chapter 4 not only represents Nebuchadnezzar the king, but it also represents the kingdom that Nebuchadnezzar represented, which is Babylon. Notice that this kingdom is powerful, and it sustains many, but the kingdom comes to an end. The tree in Revelation chapter 20, the tree of life, represents the kingdom of God, represents that stone that grows into a great mountain and fills the whole earth. That tree lasts forever. The kingdom of God lasts forever. Revelation chapter 22, verse 2, talking about that tree of life, it says, in the midst of the street and on either side of the river was a tree, was the tree of life, which bore 12 different types of fruit, each tree yielding its fruit every month. The leaves of the tree for, were for the healing of the nation. So the tree of life bears 12 different types of fruit. It's also interesting that Isaiah says that from one Sabbath to another, and from one new moon or one month to another, all flesh shall gather in the New Jerusalem. Now, part of the reason why everyone gathers together on a monthly basis in the New Jerusalem when the earth is made new is because there's a different kind of fruit on the tree of life every month. And you want to go gather that different kind of fruit. So I'm not sure what the fruit's going to be like, but I think there's going to be some durian on the tree of life. You all know what durian is? It's a great fruit. It kind of smells a little funny, but it's a good fruit. Call it the king of fruits. Maybe some mango will be on the tree. Whatever it is, some heavenly fruit, and you're going to want to gather in the New Jerusalem every month to partake of that wonderful fruit. It also says the leaves are for the, the healing of the nations, and that's not that people in the new earth will get sick, but there is an opportunity for nations to gather together, to visit, to heal, to grow spiritually, to grow in fellowship, to commune. Gathering under the tree of life is a symbol of fellowship in union in the earth made new. Verse 22, Daniel is speaking. It is to you, O king, who have, great, who have grown and become strong, for your greatness has grown and reached to the heavens and your dominion to the ends of the earth, at least the then known world. Babylon was the most powerful kingdom at the time. Nebuchadnezzar the king is mentioned nearly 90 times in the Bible and figures prominently in the books of 2 Kings, 2 Chronicles, Jeremiah, and Daniel. In Jeremiah chapter 4, verse 7, he's called the destroyer of nations, which accurately describes his conquests. At the height of his power, the Babylonian Empire included parts of modern-day Kuwait, Iraq, Syria, Jordan, Israel, Lebanon, and Turkey. The splendor of the capital city of Babylon, with its hanging gardens, its decorative gates, its grand temples, surpassed in magnificence all the cities of the Near East. Archaeological discoveries of clay tablets in the ruins of ancient Babylon describe Nebuchadnezzar's ascension to the throne. On one of the tablets in particular, known as the Babylonian Chronicle Number no. 5, which is also called the Jerusalem Chronicle, it records the events in the early years of Nebuchadnezzar and tells how Nebuchadnezzar, with the Babylonian army, marched to Carchemish in 605 BC and defeated the Egyptian army just like the Bible tells us. While there, he received word that his father, Nabopolassar, had died. The table reads, and this is actually a quote from the actual tablet written in Babylonian cuneiform. It says, for 21 years, Nabopolassar had been king of Babylon, when on the 8th of Abu, that's the 15th of August, 605, he went to his destiny, he died, in the months of Ululu, 
September, Nebuchadnezzar returned to Babylon, and on one Ululu, which is the 7th of September, 605, he sat on the royal throne in Babylon. The Babylonian Chronicle also records Nebuchadnezzar's defeat of Jerusalem and confirms the numerous details of the biblical account recorded for us in 2 Kings chapter 24. So it's always nice when you read the biblical account and then archeologists go and they dig and as they find artifacts and these ancient tablets and ancient writings, it helps to affirm the historical accuracy of what we read in the Bible. And that's exactly what's happened in the discoveries around ancient Babylon. Verse 23. And inasmuch as the king saw a watcher, still Daniel speaking, a holy one coming down from heaven and saying, chop down the tree and destroy it, but leave its stump and its roots in the earth, bound with a band of iron and bronze in the tender grass of the field, let it be wet with the dew of heaven and let him graze with the beasts of the field till seven times pass over him. In this verse, Daniel summarizes the main features of the dream. He talks about a holy one coming down from heaven who is commanded to chop down the tree and leave a band of iron and bronze around the stump. And he also announces a time period of seven years that was to pass. Daniel referred to the stump left in the ground as him, identifying that the tree was a symbol of a person. And of course, in this case, it's a symbol of Nebuchadnezzar. Now, who is this holy watcher that the Bible speaks of, one that came down? Well, it's clearly a heavenly being because it talks about a heavenly watcher. It talks about watchers early on in the chapter. So it's not just one, it's several of them. Now, some have suggested maybe this could be an angel. Others have suggested that maybe the holy watchers could have a reference to the 24 elders that you read about in Revelation chapter 4. It's the same group that you read about in Job when it speaks about the sons of God gathered together for a meeting. And Satan showed up as the representative of the earth. You remember that story? So some feel the holy watchers could very well be these 24 elders that you read about who are witnessing what's happening here on the earth. And they are witnessing the judgments and the decisions made by God. And they are giving their support to these judgments. And they can see how God is merciful and he's trying to reach people. And in this case, they see what God is doing to try and reach Nebuchadnezzar the king. But a time of judgment was coming upon the king this holy watcher, this angelic being, perhaps one of the 24 elders, or maybe even the angel Gabriel, comes and declares a judgment that is about to come upon the king. Verse 24, this is the interpretation, O king, and this is the decree of the Most High, which has come upon my Lord, the king. Now notice Daniel's reference to God as the Most High. This is a phrase that Nebuchadnezzar was familiar with. Uh, Early on in Daniel chapter 3, he spoke of the Hebrew God as the Most High God. When he spoke of Daniel, he said, in him dwells the Spirit of the Most High God. So Nebuchadnezzar understood that the Most High God is a symbol of the heavenly God or the heavenly being. He wanted to direct the attention of Nebuchadnezzar to the living and the true God who is above all and presides over all. The intent of the dream and Daniel's interpretation was to impress upon the king the sovereignty of the God of heaven. Daniel emphasized that this was by decree. It was not a matter of chance that calamity would come upon the king, but it was the purpose of the God of heaven to humble the proud monarch and to lead him to a point of repentance. Why does God allow trials and difficulties to come upon us? Well, for one, God is wanting to lead us to a point of repentance. Perhaps there is something that needs to be revealed to us in our lives that only trials or difficulties can make known to us. But not only do trials and difficulties come for our own salvation, but it might also come upon us as a witness to others, right? Because God is using our trials and the way we respond to trials as a testimony of our faith. And others look at that and they say, sure enough, the spirit of the most high God dwells within him. Did Daniel go through trials and difficulties? We're going to read later on in chapter 5 or chapter 6 how Daniel is thrown into the lion's den as a testimony of his faith. Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego went into trials as a testimony of their faith. So not only are trials for our salvation, but trials that come upon us can also be for the salvation of others. In this case, it is for the salvation of Nebuchadnezzar, as we're going to find out here in just a few moments, but it's also an example or Through this trial, it's a testimony to all of those in Babylon of the Most High God. Yes. Did you have a question? Yeah, I did. Not really a question, just a comment. Um, uh, Just in 
my studies, I think I think trials also prepare us for the very last days. Okay, good point. Because if we cannot overcome little things, the bigger things in the end we're not going to. Oh, be good point. Let me let me repeat that. Not only are trials, as we mentioned, for our own salvation. Not only are they a witness to others, but trials also help to prepare us for what is yet to come. Amen. If we can exercise faith in the smaller things of life now, that's going to strengthen our faith when the mark of the beast issue becomes an issue. And we have to choose, right? Are we going to serve God and keep his commandments? Or are we going to go along with the beast power, receiving the mark of the beast so that we can buy and sell? Where is our trust going to be? So that's why the Bible tells us to rejoice even in trials. For the trying of our faith produces patience. Not always easy to rejoice in trials, is it? But God is able to sustain us through these trials, and there is something we can learn through these trials. Well, God in his mercy has brought, brought these trials upon the king. All right, look at Romans. Did we read the note there? Okay. Notice Daniel's reference here to the Most High God. He wanted to direct the attention of Nebuchadnezzar to the living and the true God, who is above all and presides over all. The intent of the dream and Daniel's interpretation was to impress upon the king the sovereignty of the God of heaven. Daniel emphasized that this was by decree. It was not a matter of chance or calamity it would come upon the king, but it was the purpose of God of heaven to humble the proud monarch to lead him to repentance. I think we did read that, right? But Romans chapter 2, verse 4, talking about trials. Or do you despise the riches of his goodness and forbearance and long suffering, not knowing that it is what? The goodness of God that leads you to repentance. It's interesting that trials and difficulties sometimes can be the goodness of God. <laughs> Despite the trial, it is God's goodness to lead us to a point of repentance, to reveal to us our need, to reveal to us our heart's condition. Second Peter chapter 3 and verse 9 and 10. The Lord is not slack concerning his promise, as some men count slackness, but he is long-suffering towards us, not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. But the day of the Lord will come as a thief in the night, in which the heavens will pass away with a great noise, and the elements will melt with fervent heat, and both the earth and the works that are therein shall be burnt up. I want you to notice a few things about this verse. First of all, who was the one that wrote 2 Peter chapter 3, verse 9? The apostle Peter. And he says, the Lord is not slack concerning his promise. What promise is Peter talking about? Remember, Jesus said to his disciples, let not your hearts be troubled. You believe in God, believe also in me. In my Father's house there are many mansions. If it went not so, I would have told you. And here's the promise. I go to prepare a place for you. And if I go and prepare a place for you, what did Jesus say? I will come again and receive you unto myself, that where I am there you may be also. Who was in the crowd that day when Jesus said those words? The apostle Peter, along with the other apostles. So here, this is after, of course, the resurrection. Christ has already ascended to heaven. Things have moved on. The Christian church is beginning to grow. And people are saying, well, why has Jesus not come? Has he forgotten his promise? Peter says, the Lord is not slack concerning his promise. Why has Jesus not come? Why has the second coming of Christ tarried for almost 2,000 years? Well, the Bible, Peter tells us the reason is because God is long-suffering. He's not willing that any should perish, but that what? All should come to repentance. You know, we look at our world and we see all the sorrow and the pain and the suffering. We see wars. We see innocent people suffering. We see famine. We see all of these natural disasters and we think, Lord, why? Why are you allowing this to just keep going? Why don't you bring things to an end? Why don't you make all things new? Why not? Because the Lord is long suffering, not willing that any should perish. Now, of course, there are those who are going to be perishing. But God is giving as much time as he possibly can for the gospel to be preached, for the three angels' messages to be proclaimed to every nation, kindred, tongue, and people. But the hour of judgment will come. The day of the Lord will come, it says. There's a thief in the night. Not that Christ's second coming will be quiet. When it says he comes as a thief in the night, it's not a secret rapture that Peter is talking about. He's talking about the unexpectedness of Christ's coming. You don't know when the thief's going to come. But well, when the thief comes and he steals everything in your house, you know he's come, right? Nothing secret about that. Now, for the believer, the second coming of Christ is not a secret, for we have certain signs. The Bible says that we not, need not be ignorant concerning the times and the seasons, 
that that day should take us, come upon us unawares. But for the world, it's not ready for Jesus to come. He comes unexpectedly, and when he comes, it says, the earth shall melt with fervent heat, and the works that are therein shall be burnt up, but the righteous shall be saved. We shall be taken to heaven. So that's why we are suffering and pain on earth today. It's not because God has forgotten his promise or that God is not merciful, but God is waiting. And God is sustaining us by his spirit, and he's given us the promise. He says, don't worry. I, I know it's trials and difficult. I know it's not easy. I know it's painful. Jesus says, I know what you're going through. I was tempted in all points like as you are, but you just hold on. I have a purpose. There is somebody I want to reach through this trial, through this difficulty. You know, I've been in those experiences before. We've met people in the hospital. And they are suffering with sickness or disease or cancer. And we are praying for them. It seems that the disease is getting worse. And we think, Lord, why don't you heal them? But they pass away. And it's only after they pass away that we find out that because of the faith and trust of that person, even going through that terrible trial, that their life, their testimony was a witness to others. And through their suffering and death, they're actually the reason that others have come to a knowledge of the truth, come to serve the Lord. So we don't see the end from the beginning, right? We place ourselves in the hands of God and trust in him that he's working all things out for the good of those that love him. So yes, trials and difficulties will come. All right, verse 25. Daniel chapter 4, verse 25, it says, speaking of Nebuchadnezzar, Daniel, it says, and you'll, they will drive you from men. Your dwelling shall be with the beasts of the field, and they shall make you eat grass like oxen, and shall be wet with the dew of heaven. Seven times shall pass over you till you know that the Most High rules in the kingdoms of men and gives it to whomever he chooses. Nebuchadnezzar was to experience some form of insanity. He would imagine himself to be a, an animal and would be removed from society. The king would live outside in the field for seven years before his understanding would return to him and he would realize the God of heaven rules. Verse 26, still continuing, it says, some have wondered why the insane king was not replaced by someone else when it became evident that he could not rule the kingdom. The reason was probably because of the belief that an evil spirit caused all insanity and if another filled the insane person's position while he was still alive, the evil spirit would inflict some terrible calamity upon the one who had taken his place. Also, it is possible that Daniel, having a high position in Babylon and knowing that Nebuchadnezzar's insanity was only temporary, was able to secure the king's throne until his recovery. It's quite remarkable. For seven years, uh, they uh, you know, sort of protected the king's throne until the insanity left him. Daniel could have easily have claimed authority for himself, but yet he trusted in God and kept the kingdom safe. Verse 27, therefore, o king, he says, let my advice be acceptable to you. Break off your sins by righteousness, notice that sins, and your iniquities, notice that word iniquities, by showing mercy to the poor, perhaps there may be a lengthening of your prosperity. So what is the advice that the prophet gives to the king? Of course, he tells him that judgment is coming, and he says there are two things. Number one, he talks about his sins, and he talks about his iniquities. Now, when the Bible just defines what sin is, the Bible says sin is the, can you finish the verse? Sin is the transgression of what? The law. What is the word transgression? It simply means the breaking of or a disregard to the commandments, the law. So sin is the transgression of the law. But the word iniquity is rather interesting. The word iniquity has to do with selfishness. The original word iniquity comes from the root word that means a bent to oneself or self-centeredness. So not only is Nebuchadnezzar's problem a disregard of the commandments of God, but he's also got a problem with pride, with iniquity. It is a bent towards self, right? That is the root of sin. That is the root of transgression, a bent towards self. All of us have the problem with iniquity. By nature, the carnal nature is self-centered. And we want to say, Lord, please cleanse my heart from selfishness. Now, notice how selfishness or iniquity, how that could be cured. Daniel says, and your iniquities by showing mercy to the poor. It is in ministering to others that selfishness can be overcome. 
If we are simply living for ourselves and we are self-centered, we will never be able to overcome iniquity. But with God's help, if we look outside of ourselves and we look for opportunity to serve and minister to others, that's how the Holy Spirit can cleanse iniquity from the heart. Does that make sense? So a change of heart needs to come when we look outside of ourselves. We invite Jesus to cleanse us of self. All right, look at the note there. Having faithfully interpreted the dream, Daniel then urges the proud king to repent and to turn to God so that he might avert the threatened calamity. In the record of human re history, the rise and fall of kingdoms appear uh, dependent upon the will and the power of man. But the Bible reveal, reveals that governments, like individuals, have a time of probation. And when the cup of the iniquity is full, threatened judgments will come. So this great tree not only represented Nebuchadnezzar, but it also represented the kingdom of Babylon. It talks about a time of judgment that is to come upon the kingdom. Now, was that true only of Old Testament kingdoms? Was it true only of Babylon, Medo-Persia, Greece, and Rome? Or that principle that every nation has a time of probation, and that probation time will eventually come to a close, is that still true today? Let me read you a verse, Revelation chapter 13 and verse 11. Then I saw another beast coming up out of the earth. He had two horns like a lamb, but can you finish the verse? He spake as a dragon. Who is this beast that seems coming up from the earth? Remember Revelation 13, there are two beasts. The first comes up from the sea. And the sea represents multitudes and nations and kindreds and tongues, represents Europe primarily, nations surrounding the Mediterranean. But there is another beast that arises around 1798 that comes from the earth. It's built on two lamb-like principles. The lamb is a symbol of Christ. But there is a time of probation given to this nation which eventually will come to an end when she begins to speak like a dragon. We have been told through inspiration that national, national apostasy is followed by national calamity or judgments. So God has given the United States a probationary time. And we're still living in that probationary time. God has given us an opportunity to proclaim the everlasting gospel. He's given us the freedoms to preach and teach. But the time is going to come when those freedoms are taken away. And certain laws are being passed that restrict religious worship and this great nation will reach a time when its probation will end and national calamities will come. Calamities upon cities, natural disasters, political unrest, economic devastation. The seven last plagues eventually get poured out. Now those who have the seal of God when that time comes, they will be spared, right? They'll be protected. But there is a time of judgment coming upon this nation. Thus, the three angels' messages have to go to every nation, kindred, tongue, and people. All right, Jeremiah chapter 18 makes this point even more so. Jeremiah 18, verse 7, it says, The instance I speak concerning a nation, concerning a kingdom, to pluck up, to pull down, to destroy it. If that nation against whom I have spoken turns from its evil, I will re relent of the disaster I thought to bring upon it. And the instance I speak concerning a nation, concerning a kingdom, to build and to plant it, if it does evil in my sight so that it does not obey my voice, then I will relent concerning the good with which I said I would benefit it or the kingdom or the nation. Jonah chapter 3 verse 5, you remember the story. Nineveh apostatized. It was a wicked city, but they received the message of Jonah. So the people of Nineveh believed God, proclaimed a fast, and put on sackcloth from the greatest to the least of them. Then God saw their works, that they had turned from the evil way, and God relented from the disaster that he said he would bring upon them, and he did not do it. Ecclesiastes chapter 8, verse 11 and 12. It says, because a sentence against an evil work is not executed speedily, therefore the heart of the sons of men is fully set in them to do evil. Though a sinner does evil a hundred times, and his days are prolonged, yet I surely know that it will be well with those who fear God, who fear before him. It might seem that the enemy of souls it seems like the wicked are prospering. You wonder, Lord, why are you allowing this to happen? The Bible says, I know it's better for those who put their trust in God, for their day will finally come to an end. Verse 28, all this came upon King Nebuchadnezzar, the dream met its fulfillment. Daniel inserts verses 28 to 33 to make the story complete 
by telling how that the dream was fulfilled. A summary of what happened to Nebuchadnezzar is also repeated by Daniel to Belshazzar, his grandson, recorded for us in Daniel chapter 5. And you can read about that. I'm not going to read through the whole verse, but Daniel chapter 5, 18 through 22, tells us about that story. Verse 29. At the end of the 12 months, he, Nebuchadnezzar, was walking about the royal palace of Babylon. After how many months? 12 months. So again, at the beginning of his reign, probably three years or maybe even less, maybe two years into Nebuchadnezzar's reign, he has the first dream, Daniel chapter 2, with the various kingdoms and the stone that strikes the image, forms the great mountain. And then probably five, six, seven years after that, we're not exactly sure, he has the dream, or at least he makes the image. Not the dream, but he makes the image. We call it for us in Daniel chapter 3. Now, this is a number of years into Nebuchadnezzar's reign. This is actually near the end of his reign that he has this dream in Daniel chapter 4. So a lot has happened. Well, after the dream, at first, Nebuchadnezzar is impressed, but as time goes on, a whole year goes by, and the impression made by the dream begins to wane. For a time, the warning and the counsel given by Daniel made a deep impression upon the king. But as the, ma- the months passed, Nebuchadnezzar allowed himself again to be controlled by, prideful, by a prideful spirit. And he used his God-given talents for self-glorification. The threatened judgment was delayed for 12 months to see if he would humble his heart. So there is a message warning, a judgment message given to Nebuchadnezzar. Now, I'm going to bring this a little closer to home. Has God given his church, his people in the last days, a warning message, a message of judgment? I'm going to make this personal. The Bible tells us in Revelation chapter 2 and 3 that Christ has messages to the seven churches. And each of the seven churches that we find in Revelation chapter 2 and 3 represents a time period within the Christian church, right? You have the, the first church, the church of uh, Philadelphia. Oh, no, no, sorry, the church of Sardis. Church of Sardis, the first church, Ephesus. Boy, I almost went through all the churches. It's the church of Ephesus. Then the church of Smyrna. The church of Ephesus represents the church at the time of John, the first 100 years. And then you have the church of Smyrna is a persecuted church. Church of Philadelphia, which is the sixth church. Pergamos, yes, I'm skipping a bunch of them. Then you've got the sixth church, church of uh, Philadelphia, brotherly love, which represents the early 1800s, the time when the uh, truths of the word, a study of the prophecies, Great revival took place in the church, but eventually we get to the seventh church, right? That's the church we're living in now. And the church, the seventh church represents the church of, called the church of Laodicea. It is spiritually lukewarm. It represents the church. Not only does the church of Laodicea represent the church, but it represents the members in the church. It represents you and me, right? And just like God sent a warning message to Nebuchadnezzar through a prophetic message through Daniel, God has sent the church of Laodicea, its members, a warning message. It's the message come through Jesus. This is what Jesus said to the church of Laodicea. Notice the similarities between the condition of the church and the condition of Nebuchadnezzar the king. Notice the similarities. Revelation chapter 3, verse 17, it says, Because you say I'm rich, This is Christ's message to Laodicea. I have become wealthy and have need of nothing. Sounds like Nebuchadnezzar. And you do not know that you are wretched, miserable, poor, blind, and naked. Nebuchadnezzar thought that he was rich. He had become wealthy. He thought he had need of nothing. But spiritually speaking, he was wretched, miserable, poor, blind, and naked. Jesus says to the church of Laodicea, I counsel of you to buy from me Gold refined in the fire. Now, did Nebuchadnezzar think that he had enough gold? What was the head in Daniel chapter 2 made of? Gold. Babylon was called the golden kingdom. Wealthy. So the church today has much gold. It has much financial support. It's wealthy. Not only that, individually, we are satisfied. We think we have all the truth. We are comfortable with what we have. It says, buy of me gold refining the fire that you might be rich, at least rich in heaven's eyes. What is the most valuable thing in the eyes of heaven that we as individuals can have? It's two things. It's faith and it's love. The Bible says now about faith, hope, and love, these three, but the greatest of these is love. 
What is it that Jesus wants us to have in our hearts? He wants the love of Christ in our hearts. That's true greatness, right? That you may be rich. And it says white, game, uh, white garments, that you may be clothed, that the shame of your nakedness or your sins might not be revealed. What does this white garment represent in Revelation 3? It's the robe of Christ's righteousness. Now, when I say the robe of Christ's righteousness, there are two parts to that righteousness. There is theologically what we call the imputed righteousness of Christ, and there is the imparted righteousness of Christ. The imputed righteousness of Christ is what you can maybe call justification because Jesus died for our sins. We accept his sacrifice on our behalf. His life takes the place of our lives and we stand before God just as if we have never sinned. God does not see our righteousness, but he sees Christ's righteousness. That's justification. But all of those who have experienced genuine justification will also experience what we call sanctification. You see, that robe of Christ's righteousness that justifies us is also the means by which Christ uses to sanctify us. If you have Christ's robe of righteousness on, that robe of righteousness begins to do a work of cleansing in the heart, begins to remove self and transgression to the law, brings us into perfect obedience, right? So to the church of Laodicea, he says, you need my robe of righteousness. And then anoint your eyes with eye salve that you may see. The eye salve represents spiritual discernment. It's the Holy Spirit. Does the church need a special outpouring of the Holy Spirit in the last days? Do believers in Christ need a special outpouring of the Holy Spirit in the last days? You know, only those who are seeking the latter rain through inviting Jesus to come into their hearts and minds daily, those who are humbling their hearts, those who are seeking Christ's robe of righteousness, they are the ones that will be filled with the Holy Spirit. Those who are content with an intellectual understanding of truth but are not experiencing an earnest desire for a change of heart, they miss out on the latter rain when it comes, right? The Holy Spirit has not yet been poured out in its fullness. But the promise is that it will come. And those who are emptying, emptying themselves, they will be filled with the Holy Spirit. Then Jesus says, as many as I love, rebuke and chasten, therefore be zealous and repent. Behold, I stand at the door and knock. Jesus is knocking at the heart's door. He says, whoever hears my voice and opens the door, I will come in unto him and I will dine with him and he with me. What does the church need more than anything else? We don't need more truth. We have sufficient truth in God's word to get us into the kingdom. We have the truth. We know the prophetic truths. What we need more than anything else is the love of Jesus in the heart. Amen. We need Christ dwelling within. We need our minds to be open to the influence of the Holy Spirit. How do you open the door of your heart and invite Jesus to come in? You know, I've been recently studying. I've been studying the words of Jesus. If you want to have an interesting Bible study, just look up the red words in the Gospels, starting in Matthew, and read all of the words of Jesus. And think about it. In my study of the words of Jesus, I was reading about how that Jesus cleansed the temple of those who bought and sold of course, the temple is a symbol of the heart. No, you're not that your body is the temple of the Holy Spirit. And if Jesus comes in, he cleanses the heart and the mind, but it's up to us to bring Jesus in. And the temple is the mind. It is through our thoughts that we invite Jesus to come in. It is by thinking upon him that he's able to do a work of cleansing. So we need to open the mind, open the heart through our thoughts, inviting Jesus to come in. We can say a whole lot more about that, but back to our story. Verse 30, the, skin, the king spoke and said, this is still Nebuchadnezzar during those 12 months of probationary time, is this not great Babylon that I have built for a royal dwelling by my mighty power and for the honor of my majesty? It's all me, me, me. Nebuchadnezzar was not only the greatest king of Babylon, but he was also known as the city's greatest builder. He transformed the narrow streets into magnificent boulevards and built beautiful temples and palaces and gardens. Excavations of ancient Babylon, which began in 1899, unearthed thousands of bricks stamped with the name of Nebuchadnezzar and the titles of the king. Here's actually one of the very uh, bricks, clay bricks. This one looks like it's a little bit burnt, but there it is. You can see a cuneiform stamp. This is amazing. And this is what that, uh, that statement actually says on there. It says, Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon. There's his name, who provides for the temples. He mentions two of the 
of the temples there, the eldest son of Nabopolassar, king of Babylon. So there we have a historical archaeological find validating the Bible, and there's thousands of these uh, bricks that was unearthed in ancient Babylon. Verse 31, while the word was still in the king's mouth, a voice fell from heaven, King Nebuchadnezzar, to you it is spoken, the kingdom has departed from you. Despite the warning that God had given him, Nebuchadnezzar did, not, did the very thing that the Lord told him not to do. He looked upon his kingdom with pride and exclaimed, is not this great Babylon that I have built? And at that very moment, his reason was removed and all the wisdom he had prided himself on having taken away from him. Verse 32, and they shall drive you from men and your dwelling shall be with the beasts of the field. They shall make you eat grass like oxen. And seven times shall pass over you until you know that the Most High rules in the kingdoms of men and gives it to whomever he chooses. For seven years, Nebuchadnezzar considered considered himself a wild beast and behaved ridiculously, eating grass like cattle and staying outside in the open field. These words of exaltation were much like the words spoken by Lucifer before his fall. Notice the similarities, Isaiah chapter 14. How are you fallen from heaven, O Lucifer, son of the morning? How are you cut down to the ground, you who weaken the nations? Verse 13. For you have said where in your, it begins with our thoughts, it begins with our mind. He didn't first begin to speak, he began to say in his heart, he began to think. For you have said in your heart, I will ascend into heaven. I will exalt my throne above the stars of God. That's the angels. I will also sit on the mount of the congregation on the farthest sides of the north. I will ascend above the heights of the clouds. I shall be like the most high. Iniquity is selfishness. It begins in the heart, and eventually it's manifest in the words. It's manifest in the actions. Verse 33. That very hour, the word was fulfilled concerning Nebuchadnezzar. He was driven from man. He ate grass like oxen. His body was wet with the dew of heaven till his hair grew like eagle's feathers and his nails like bird's claws. The heavenly watcher took action against the king because of his haunty spirit and prideful actions. In a moment, he was stripped of everything he credited to himself. Even his unkept hair became matted and stiff, described here as eagle's feathers. Proverbs chapter 16, verse 18 says... Pride goes before destruction and a haunty spirit before a fall. Luke chapter 14, verse 11, For whoever exalts himself will be humbled, and he who humbles himself shall be exalted. And 1 Corinthians 10, 12, Therefore let him who thinks he stand take heed lest he falls. The Bible warns us of pride. Verse 34, it says, And at the end of time, I, Nebuchadnezzar, now this is back, Nebuchadnezzar is now writing, I, Nebuchadnezzar, lifted up my eyes to heaven, And my understanding returned to me, and I blessed the Most High and praised and honored Him who lives forever and ever. From His dominion, for His dominion is an everlasting dominion. His kingdom is from generation to generation. Don't miss the part there. It says, at the end of this time, I, Nebuchadnezzar, lifted up my eyes towards heaven. If we want to see our true spiritual condition, if we want spiritual healing for the madness of sin, if we want victory, over sin in our hearts and lives, we are to look towards heaven. Amen? Amen. Help comes from above. It is Jesus that we look to. It is his righteousness that cleanses the soul. Look towards heaven. You'll have spiritual understanding. Before his insanity, Nebuchadnezzar was tyrannical in his dealings with others and defiant towards the Hebrew God. However, after his seven years of madness, he humbly acknowledges the sovereignty of the Most High God and testifies of his mercy towards him. All the inhabitants of the earth, verse 35, are reputed as nothing. He does according to his will in the army of heaven and among the inhabitants of the earth. No one can restrain his hand or say to him, what have you done? Under the rebuke of him who is king of kings and lord of lords, Nebuchadnezzar learnt the lesson that all rulers need to know. Here's the lesson, that true greatness consists in true goodness. Spiritually speaking, True greatness in your life consists of true goodness. And where does goodness come from? It comes from Jesus. Only Christ can put true goodness in the human heart. Jesus said in Mark chapter 8, What is the profit though a man gain the whole world? And what? Loses his soul. Or what will a man give in exchange for his soul? Verse 36, Daniel 4 verse 36. 
It says, at that same time, my reason returned to me, and for the glory of my kingdom, my honor, my splendor returned to me. My counselors and my nobles resorted to me, and I was restored to my kingdom, and excellent majesty was added unto me. At the end of the seven years, God removed the hand of affliction and reason and understanding returned to the king. His first act was to bless the Most High God and to acknowledge him as the supreme ruler over all. Verse 37, now I, Nebuchadnezzar, this is the pagan king, but now he's converted. I, Nebuchadnezzar, praise and extol and honor the king of heaven. All of those whose works are true and his ways justice. And those who walk in pride, he's able to put down. Spiritually speaking, what is to be the focus of our lives? We are to praise and extol and honor the king of heaven, right? That should be the motivating principle in our lives. The reign of Nebuchadnezzar closed shortly after the restoration of his kingdom. There is no record that the king ever lapsed again into idolatry after his conversion. And it is safe to say that Nebuchadnezzar died a converted man who, like Abraham, looked forward to a city whose builder and maker is God. I think we have good reason to believe that Nebuchadnezzar is going to be in the kingdom. All right, here's our quiz. In the last two minutes, right? Let's see how much you remember from Daniel chapter 4. It's an easy quiz, so you should get full marks on this one. Question number one, who was the primary author of Daniel chapter 4? Was it Daniel, Jeremiah, or Nebuchadnezzar? What's the answer? Nebuchadnezzar, that's right. Question number two, what does he want to declare to all? This is Nebuchadnezzar, the wonders of the Most High God, the wonders of the kingdom of Babylon, or the wisdom of the Babylonian king. Is it A, B, or C? That's right, the answer is A. Number three, what troubled the king while he was at rest in his palace? The bad news of a military defeat in Egypt, a dream which made him afraid, or rebellion in the northern province of his kingdom. Is it A, B, or C? It was a dream that made him afraid. Okay, number, th- number four. Who did the king order to come before him? Was it the wise men of his kingdom, all the foreigners in the capital of the city, or his generals and military advisors? Was it A, B, or C? It was his wise men. All right, told you it was easy. Question number five. Who was the last of the wise men to appear before Nebuchadnezzar, was it Shadrach, Daniel, or Arioch? Was it A, B, or C? Mixed it up a little bit. The answer is B, right? It was Daniel. Question number six. What did the king see in his dream? A golden statue, a lion with eagle's wings, or a great tree? A, B, or C? The answer is C. Does he see a lion with eagle's wings later? No, he doesn't. Who sees a lion with eagle's wings? Trick question there, right? It's actually Daniel in Daniel 7. All right, just want to make sure you're listening. Question number seven. What was the command given by the holy watcher in the dream? Cut down the tree, bow down before the golden image, or remove the wings of the lion. Was it A, B, or C? A, cut down the tree. Question number eight. What was left in the earth? The seed of the tree, the roots of the tree, or the stump of the tree? A, B, or C? Stump of the tree with a band of iron and bronze. Verse 9, how long was the stump to remain with the band of iron and brass? Was it for 100 years, 7 years, or 500 days? A, B, or C? 7 years. Okay, question number 10. Why did Daniel hesitate to give the interpretation of the dream? Was it because he was not fluent in the Babylonian language? Or was it because of the delicate matter of giving bad news to the king? Or thirdly, because he was waiting for a second dream to confirm its meaning. A, B, or C? The answer is B. Number 11. Who did the tree represent in the dream? The nation of Israel? Nico, king of Egypt? Or Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon? You all should get that one, right? Question number 12. What did the cutting down of the tree symbolize in Daniel 4? The king would go insane for seven years. The kingdom of Babylon would have war for seven years. Or the king would be put in prison for seven years. The answer is A. I told you it was easy. Question number 13. What advice did Daniel give to the king after interpreting his dream? He needed to fund the rebuilding of the temple in Jerusalem. He needed to break off his sins by showing mercy to the poor. He needed to allow the Jews to return to their homeland. Is it A, B, or C? The answer is B. 
Number 14, I think our last question here. What did the king do after the dream met its fulfillment? He blessed and honored the Most High who lives forever and ever. He turned the kingdom over to his son. He built a new temple in Babylon dedicated to the Hebrew God. A, B, or C. The answer, of course, there is A. All right, that's Daniel chapter 4. Interesting study, right? Not only is it a chapter about a pagan king that's converted, but there are lessons for us individually as we study through Daniel chapter 4. Next week, God willing, we'll continue our study with Daniel chapter 5. Let's close with prayer. Dear Father, once again, we are so grateful for your word. We are grateful for the lessons that you reveal to us in Scripture. We thank you, Lord, for your mercy and for the warnings that you give us. And Father, we are even grateful for the trials and difficulties that might come our way, not only for our own sanctifying and cleansing, but as an example and a witness to others that our confidence, our faith is in the Most High God, the one who rules in the kingdoms of earth and in heaven. Lord, help us to be faithful. Help us to be emptied of self that we might be filled with your Spirit. We thank you, Lord, for these lessons in Scripture. In Jesus' name, amen. We're going to take a short break, and then we're going to continue with our worship service. God bless you.